Hello everybody, I'm Elaine from Cerebra's communications team and welcome to another one of our tea break talks uh, where I get to catch up with a variety of people from across the charity's work just to find out a little bit more about what's going on in their areas. Um, so today really the focus of our chat is about premature birth and the impact and the link that can have um, to brain conditions and to childhood um, disabilities, but importantly about the work that we're doing to, to prevent that. So I am really delighted to welcome Mr. Nigel Simpson to our chat this morning. Hi, Nigel. Hello. Nice to Thank see you. Uh, I know. Thank you for very much for joining me. So Nigel is a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist at uh, the University of Leeds Hospital NHS Trust and also an associate professor at Leeds University. But we are really delighted and grateful that he also heads up our research um, at the University of Leeds and into premature birth. So as I say, welcome Nigel. Um, and I just wondered if we could start just by having a chat about what is premature birth, uh, what's classed as a premature birth, because um, as I think I mentioned to you before we started this interview, um, babies are being born earlier and earlier, um, you know, the, the, the medicine behind that, I suppose, uh, makes it seem problem free, but I just wondered if you could explain a bit more about that. Well, I, I think the, the, there's not too much mystery at one level with babies who are born earlier than expected, which in a sense is, is, is what we mean by preterm or premature birth. Um, to a greater extent, we're thinking of uh, babies who are born before they're fully mature, before they are ready, if you like, for uh, relatively unassisted life outside the womb. Okay. Um, and for many, that will mean help with feeding or help keeping warm. Um, and certainly for our mothers and our grandmothers, um, having babies arrive a little earlier than expected wasn't unusual. Um, and uh, in most cases, it is simply uh, that support um, of some aspects of um, early life. That's all that's needed. I think it's had much sharper focus in the last 50 years where um, it's recognized that babies who were born um, quite early, shall we say 10, year, uh, 10 weeks early, um, they had distinct problems, which meant it was very unlikely that they would survive. Um, principally uh, problems with their breathing, they would become exhausted uh, mm -hmm. and eventually they would die uh, of exhaustion, trying to keep, uh, keep trying to keep themselves breathing, um, and uh, because of that, there emerged a whole branch of pediatrics called neonatology, um, which developed uh, remarkable ways in which these babies could be supported and kept alive, and fed and uh, ventilated uh, until their systems started to mature and started to function properly, and so babies. Uh, who were previously born and, uh, and died, say, within a week or so of life, mm. uh, were suddenly starting to survive. Uh, and that process, as I say, really has, uh, ex you know, ha has increased significantly over the last 50 years into what we recognise today and we see in all the documentaries on TV of babies being born just over halfway through pregnancy, you know, 21, mm. 22 weeks. Um, and uh, remarkably um, surviving through uh, that process of care that the neonatal teams deliver. Um, and that's wonderful. And I think for most, um, for most folks, prematurity or being born early isn't a problem because, you know, we can fix it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come out good. These little fighters will make it through and, uh, that there, there really isn't an issue. Um, and uh, on one level, again, that's quite right. They, these babies will survive and they will um, integrate into their families and into society. Uh, and uh, at present, we feel their lifespan is, is probably going to be as good as their 
peers who are born at full term. Um, but when one's looked at groups of these uh, early born babies uh, later on in infancy and adolescence, uh, under the surface, one can uh, determine that things aren't quite as good as, as they could have been if they had managed to stay in their mum's womb uh, a little bit longer. And principally, um, uh, that, uh, and probably most significantly, it reveals itself in um, the neurodevelopment, the development of the brain um, that uh, has necessarily been interrupted uh, at that point when they would normally be in their mum's womb, they're out in the baby unit. Uh, and the difficulty with the brain is that once injury has taken place there, the ability of the body to repair that injury and in some ways to uh, restore normality has been significantly compromised. So it's, mm. it's different, for example, um, uh, if, if there's an injury to the arm, for example, um, where the arm is very good at repairing itself and healing. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain, sadly, will, um, will scar in that area, uh, but normality can't be uh, resumed. Once that scar's there, it's a permanent, uh, it's a permanent issue. And uh, again, we see it in several domains. The, the most striking one probably is to do with movement and locomotion, um, uh, where we're, I think everybody's familiar with a condition called cerebral palsy, where mm -hmm. there has been an interruption in those um, brain pathways which lead to movement. Uh, and on a permanent basis, that individual's ability to, to move and care for themselves and participate in normal life is affected significantly. And of course we can, we can mitigate that with the use of um, surgery and devices like canapers or wheelchairs, but it, it is irretrievable. One can't um, restore normality again. So uh, that element is affected. I think the second element, which again, we, isn't perhaps so obvious is cognition, uh, the ability to reason and think and uh, order one's life and to propel one's life in ways that most of us don't really have to think twice about. Um, so if we th look at, um, for example, IQ, um, that is significantly affected if uh, one's born early. Now, of course, you know, that, that probably for the great majority isn't going to be a big deal if it's a few points here or there, but it may make the difference between um, your ability to, um, uh, for example, um, look at uh, complex problems and reason and achieve one's potential, that, that will certainly uh, be affected. Uh, probably the last and again, the most hidden element of um, neurodevelopment that's been affected is in one's um, behavioral uh, approach. So um, what I'm thinking of are situations where it is difficult for the individual to um, participate in uh, relational matters, uh, to socialize and to cope with all the ambiguities and uh, deft footwork that's needed in those contexts, um, the socialization, if you like. And so uh, we're quite familiar with uh, a degree of what we call attention deficit hyperactivity activity disorder or autism spectrum disorder, um, where on the one hand, individuals can be severely affected and be locked into um, their, their, uh, themselves, uh, to the other end where they're, they're, somebody may have a little bit, something a bit funny about them, but actually they're, they're, they're able to cope perfectly, perfectly well. Now, we're aware that if we follow groups of babies who are born early into adolescence and uh, young adulthood, um, these children are more likely to be diagnosed with uh, ADHD or to be on some part of the autism spectrum uh, and uh, find it less easy to form um, significant relationships um, in later life. Uh, so 
uh, that again the things that we take for granted uh, mm -hmm. as individuals and as parents of children mm -hmm. about what they're going to be doing with themselves who they're going to be what role they're going to play in society can be compromised quite significantly by mm -hmm. um, being born early and again mm -hmm. it's it's very difficult to spot this one can't sort of simply look at a, a baby age two or four and predict where you're going to be there and it's even more difficult to provide that individual with the support they need to thrive despite those uh, limitations uh, in what is of course a very competitive world um, but we know that for example if you look at um, the chances of your needing support in the classroom um, are going to be um, uh, greatly increased if you're born early and even if you're born sort of at a stage of pregnancy where we probably wouldn't even sort of worry about it, say born a, a month early or you know, a month and a half early, you're three times more likely to have difficulties with you know, the development of your language and maths, for example, uh, in the classroom. And of course, if you can't perform in the classroom, that adds additional burdens and stresses to uh, an already precarious position in that evolving generation that that sort of class cohort if you like mm -hmm. um which makes it very difficult for you as an individual to um uh, make it through there and for parents especially this is uh, and teachers this is a real challenge um because those individuals need support and they need ways in which they can make it through those years to a point at which uh, they know what they're going to do with their lives. Yeah. So, so it is a bit like an iceberg. Um, I, I think mm. we, um, we're aware of it. Um, we probably don't realise how often it happens. For example, um, the, you've probably got about a one in 10 chance of being born preterm. Right. That equates to about 60,000 babies a, a year in the UK. So... The math on that is probably every 10 minutes. So probably as I've been talking, a baby's been born preterm somewhere in the UK. Uh, and so that kind of um, frequency certainly adds up uh, within a local healthcare system and a society. Uh, and is why actually, because there is limited, there are limited amounts we can do to reverse the problem later on, the one of the very important levers for change is to look at ways to prevent your baby being born preterm in the first place, because then these other issues um, are, 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 are not going to be a factor anymore. Okay. Thank and that's you. what we're all about here in Leeds. Yes, thank you for explaining that. It's, um, it, I mean, I find it really interesting, you know, about, you know, the numbers that you talk about and also that how far down the line, or, you know, how in terms of age that child may be um, before, you know, you realise that there is some, some issue. Um, so what sort of things cause premature birth, Nigel? No, that's, uh, again, a really good question. So, um, so probably about... Um, a third of babies who are born early are because mum's having problems. Uh, and many of us will um, be aware of situations where um, a mum's well-being has been threatened, say, very commonly with high blood pressure in pregnancy, a condition called preeclampsia. So uh, we know that in mums who have preeclampsia, they're, for her health um, and well-being, it is important to um, bring about the birth earlier than we would otherwise have planned. Right. So that conditions where it's felt best in the best interests of the mother and the baby sometimes, you know, if the baby's not growing well enough, again, it's best to, uh, because the, the, uh, the placenta isn't working properly, it's best to uh, bring about the birth so the baby can be cared for. Uh, and uh, can things can be restored again. So that's one group of conditions where the baby doesn't grow well or the mother develops a life-threatening condition like preeclampsia. Um, two thirds of early births, however, are, are related to what we would call spontaneous 
factors and other factors that, that arise for reasons that were not fully clear. So the mum either comes in um, laboring much earlier than expected and gives birth, or um, her waters come away early and, and that again can lead to an early birth. So these comprise about two thirds of all the early births that we see. Now, sometimes that's very easy to understand. Say for example, the mum may have a multiple pregnancy, twins or triplets, in which case, again, it's not difficult to imagine why an early birth would occur there because the poor old womb is um, uh, stretched and thinking it must be time to go now. And, and of course it's happening a little t- uh, earlier than expected. Um, we also know that um, issues regarding the, the cervix or the neck of the womb are a key part of early births where the, the neck of the womb is unable to provide uh, the ability to maintain the pregnancy by keeping itself closed. Uh, it may be either weaker or shorter than expected and that leads to um, a situation where um, bacteria come into the womb, uh, they irritate and provoke an early labour. And that's probably responsible for most of the very early um, preterm births, uh, the sort of ones that would occur, say, at six or seven months. Uh, and I suppose, for, from a parental point of view, are the ones where we worry the most, because, of course, they're, those babies' lives are at greatest jeopardy. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- those reasons probably comprise uh, the, the majority of, of the early ones. And then there are a whole... A raft of what you might call social or demographic issues, which we we recognise um, are heavily linked with early birth. Uh, say, for example, uh, you know, if we look at um, living in a less affluent area, will uh, certainly increase your chances. Very large UK study just out within the last couple of weeks again conclusively shows that if you live in a less affluent area. Uh, you are more likely to give birth earlier than your um, uh, peers who live in uh, in more affluent areas. Um, Smoking uh, and alcohol, um, uh, I'm afraid, will be responsible for quite uh, a few preterm births. Uh, What's striking about that, and smoking in particular, is that if you are able to discontinue smoking by uh, maybe as late as mid-pregnancy, you will significantly reduce your chance of an early birth. So that's why the midwives will always ask early in pregnancy, are you a smoker? Um, Do you think uh, with appropriate support, we could help you to stop smoking? Um, And they don't say that to sort of crack the whip at all. It's because it will make a meaningful difference to to, to your baby's uh, prospects. Um, uh, So if you're living in an abusive relationship, uh, or you're living, uh, you know, you're say you don't speak the language well, and you're living in uh, sort of the top floor of a uh, uh, an apartment block with threatening neighbours who all look at you in a rather condescending way. That is not going to be a great start. Um, even that sort of pressure, that social pressure in that context, will increase your chances of an early early birth. So there are many social issues which aren't a quick fix but which are probably just as significant uh, in terms of their ability to cause preterm birth which is why when we look at preterm prevention programs it's not just about clever stuff that goes on within uh, the hospital setting it is about a whole raft of uh, support that we want to deliver within the community Uh, and in conjunction with local authorities in order to make a difference there. Um, You'll often find, for example, community midwives uh, talking about continuity of carer. Um, That's the sort of buzzword we hear these days. Well, there's nothing fluffy bunny about that. It's a very serious proposal because, again, uh, we, we know from studies that if one is able to provide continuity of carer, in other words, a trusted um, link 
with a professional throughout the pregnancy, that in itself will uh, optimise that mother's chances of having a healthy term birth, um, not just prematurity, but other factors such mm. as the need for uh, intervention during the labour itself are all reduced by that continuity of care. Of course, it's very difficult to implement. Um, you know, we have we have to live within our means in the NHS and resources are very tight, no more so over the last year or so. Yeah. Um, and so um, these are all programmes which can't be done um, out, you know, in, in isolation of themselves. No. Pre-term prevention has to incorporate a sort of full court press, if you like, uh, from a, a, a number of agencies and um, authorities. Okay. So could you just tell us a bit about the work that you're doing at Leeds at the moment? Yes. So, um, so I think I'll probably sort of divide it into the sort of fundamental science um, of what we're doing uh, and also the implementation of, of what we know works, if you like, within, okay. uh, within the country as a whole. So if we take the first area, what fundamental science uh, are we pursuing uh, thanks to Cerebra within Leeds? Um, part of that is understanding the cervix and understanding the architecture of the cervix. Uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, with our uh, previous PhD student that there is a very distinct uh, encircling uh, arrangement of fibres around the inner part of the cervix which is responsible for bearing the load of the pregnancy in that sort of, um, uh, in those sort of middle months. Uh, and that is really important uh, to, to make sure that the is going on at the moment, and in particular, understanding which fibers are important in that and how they actually work. Um, so is it mostly muscle that does that or is it gristle, um, so to speak? Um, what, are the, what are the key components of that uh, inner sort of circular network of, uh, of fibres which maintain that strength? Because if we understand that, then there are ways in which we can understand how it's damaged before birth, uh, sorry, before pregnancy, I mean, uh, and uh, how we can modify um, the sort of things we do in other parts of medicine that could reduce the chance of that being injured. Okay. Um, but also novel ways in which to reinforce uh, in a more natural way uh, that uh, architecture. So, for example, at the moment, we use a rather agricultural technique called uh, a cervical stitch uh, to provide that reinforcement. Now, uh, you know, I don't think that has changed one jot over the last 60 years, although mm -hmm. we're concluding a very large study at the moment, trying to work out what type of stitch material would be best to use. Right. Um, but it involves surgery on one or two occasions. It involves a, a lot of medicalization, which might not be necessary. Um, it is successful, which is, uh, which is always heartening. Um, but there may be better ways of going about it, smarter okay. ways of going about it. Um, so uh, our studies looking at the architecture of that part of the cervix will inform the sort of care we deliver in the future. Okay. Um, uh, the other element that, we're, uh, that we, we talked about, uh, other causes of uh, early birth, the sort of problems that occur that lead to the mother having high blood pressure, uh, or that lead to the placenta malfunctioning so that we have to uh, reach in and deliver the baby earlier than planned. Again, we're using the sophisticated imaging um, tools that we have within Leeds and with our colleagues uh, elsewhere in Leeds to look at the architecture of the placenta and to understand again how what happens in those key early weeks of placental uh, development which ensure that the pregnancy will, will remain uh, healthy and disease-free after that. And part of that is understanding what unhealthy placentas look like in comparison with their, their, their healthy peers. So that's, that involves a lot of fundamental uh, imaging and understanding the molecular 
uh, structure and um, regulation of the placenta, which again offers uh, not just an insight into what's going wrong, but if you once you've worked out what's going wrong, you can start to look at the pathways which are going to um, restore normality to that process. Again, we have nothing to offer mothers who have high blood pressure in pregnancy or whose babies are not growing well, except support, surveillance, and delivery. Mm -hmm. That's all we have to offer. We, 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 we can't do anything else at the moment. And part of the reason why is because we, we don't fully understand the mechanisms by which um, the pregnancies have got themselves into that situation. Right. So a lot of our... Uh, um, a lot of our current research is looking at the, the makeup of the placenta and what, is the, what are the pathways that are not functioning properly. So um, that's, if you like, is our, those are our bits of the jigsaw that is going into the sort of the, the, the global fight against prematurity. Um, the other element where I think Cerebra has significantly changed the, the face of care within the UK is the ability that it gives uh, teams like ourselves to work together nationally to influence public policy and to ensure that any woman anywhere within the UK can access the care that, for example, the women in Leeds or the women around some of the other big preterm prevention services in the, in the UK can offer. So, mm -hmm the formation of the UK's preterm clinical network was part of that um, work that's emerged over the last seven years. We're having our next annual meeting, virtual sadly, but you know we'll, we'll be face to face again shortly, hopefully that'll happen next week. Uh, and every, uh, every year we get more and more units within the UK coming to us to be part of that group and to learn about what it is to provide a preterm prevention service in their locality. Uh, and so that means that more and more women yeah. around the UK can go to their local maternity unit, knowing that there'll be an expert there who can provide them with advice and support and intervention to prevent their babies being born early. Yeah. Um, and part of that, again, is, is uh, learning that a network like, like that functions by escalation. So if, mm -hmm. if you don't know what to do, somebody else within the mm -hmm. network is likely to be able to help. Uh, the other function of a network is that we can go to government and say, we feel this is the best strategy to adopt if you're aiming, as the government uh, did through their document, Safe and Maternity Care, to reduce the number of stillborn um, uh, or uh, neonatal deaths, and importantly, brain injury, which the government wants to halve by 2025 okay. by 50%. Uh, if you're going to do that, you have to address prematurity. Um, and uh, because of the voice that Cerebras has given us, and because we are able to, if you like, work um, as, a, as a national body, we're able to go to government and... Uh, bring into policy the sort of um, the, the sort of asks that the uh, NHS make of maternity units to provide preterm prevention clinics, which is uh, again through a document called Saving Babies' Lives, which mm -hmm. came out in 2019. Um, that has an element specifically looking at the prevention of preterm birth and the setting up of clinics. So now. Trust every year will uh, be asked, are you providing that kind of service? And more than that, what impact is it having on your community? So that um, people are engaged at a local level uh, in order to, uh, to, 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 to look at the problems they have in their locality and to adopt prevention strategies. Now, the other arm of that is to mm -hmm is to make sure that mothers around the country are empowered uh, to be able to ask those same questions, either, to, either through um, maternity voice partnerships, but also directly um, uh, asking of their maternity service, look, I've had an early birth in the past, 
who is going to look after me and what are you going to do? Um, it's giving that power to women through um, support groups like um, UK Incompetent Cervix, for example, who are pioneers in this area, um, the ability to know who they can contact in their area so that they can get the care that they deserve uh, and that they need. Now, I think in the past that couldn't have been possible. Um, the, the notion of contacting your local specialist was laughable, if you like, but now we live in a society that's far more accountable. It's not a surprise anymore. We are able to connect by social media uh, and uh, meet uh, with other um, parents uh, or individuals who've been in that position. And we know this, you know, we there is that ability for mums to make a difference in their own care. And that mm -hmm. is something that we, uh, we, we support as well. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it is part of a, if you like, uh, that national strategy is sort of largely unwritten, but it, it depends on lots of stakeholders yeah. like Cerebra, like uh, other charities like Tommy's, um, Baby Lifeline, uh, support groups like UK Incompetent Cervix, uh, and um, professional bodies like the UK Preterm Clinical Network, um, all working together because we all believe that preterm birth is a real concern. It is a public health risk. Uh, and we want to do everything we can to uh, prevent preterm birth or in those babies who are being born preterm to mitigate, to reduce the, the risks that they face. Because there are obviously other things that we can do uh, when preterm birth is a certainty to reduce the chance of that baby being affected. Say, for example, giving um, steroids to the mother, which pass across into the baby's circulation, we know that's very effective at preventing brain injury. But it's only effective if it's given at the right time and the right way. Uh, so again, educating individuals and doing what we call quality, um, uh, quality uh, implementation um, uh, pr programs to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're, we're able to make sure that our colleagues uh, on the maternity unit and the neonatal unit are supported in their quest when a mum comes in who's likely to give birth early, yeah. providing those, those supports. Okay, thank you so much for explaining all of that. Um, it's it's really positive to hear um, to what what's being taken forward. But I just wondered, you know, we talk about sort of empowering mums to to ask about their care and and to to feel um, able um, to contact people and ask questions. But are there sort of any, uh, is there any advice, are there any tips that you can give prospective mums and dads or, you know, mums who are, who are expecting that things that they can do quite simply to lessen the chances of them having a premature birth? That's a really good question, Elaine. So I would say that the, it, if possible, think about it before the, before you get pregnant. Yes. Okay. Uh, and the key to that is perhaps, uh, seeing your GP if you have a medical condition to see if there are implications of that condition during pregnancy. Yes, okay. uh, that, that's not that common, but uh, obviously if your condition might affect the pregnancy, you want to make sure you know enough about it and have optimised those issues before you get pregnant. So that's first thing. Uh, also, of course, if you have had a pregnancy before that was complicated, mm -hmm. Again, seeking professional help, either your GP or the community midwife uh, in the first place, or if necessary, a specialist in, in your local maternity unit to understand why the complication occurred in a previous pregnancy and to put in place plans to reduce the chance of that happening before and during the current pregnancy are really important. So again, preparing before pregnancy is important if you can stop smoking and stop drinking, that is absolutely essential. Um, and uh, you know, that, 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 that is uh, something that can be done well before you, you, you get pregnant. Taking prenatal vitamins, particularly the use of folate, uh, is, is a really important key to ensuring the, um, the, the health of your baby. And you, 
would ideally take that um, round about the time uh, you conceive or in the months leading up to that time it is, is very important. Now, I think it's probably well known that for most couples, the first they know about it is when they see the blue line. Um, but that is not, that's not too late at all. You've heard, of, again, earlier from me about talking about it, it's never too late. So uh, again, stopping smoking, stopping drinking, eating sensibly, okay, by which I mean sort of eating a balanced diet with plenty of green in it, uh, and um, uh, ensuring that you're getting regular exercise. And that's exercise that's not just physical, um, but also mental as well. And I recognize this is easier for some than for others. If, for example, you're uh, working uh, in, in an environment where there is lots of pressure or there is uh, lots of manual labor, that is a really difficult issue. Uh, most UK companies uh, have a duty of care for their employees. Uh, and it is important to see your line manager at an early stage to see what can be remedied, what can be, uh, you know, what can be adjusted in, in your work uh, on account of your pregnancy. Now, for many, that really won't make much difference um, because you know, it, the, there won't be much that needs to be done. But for some mums, that could be very important. I think the next absolutely important strut in this is to meet up with your community midwife uh, at an early stage because the community midwife will be able to uh, take a more nuanced history as to what's happened in the past and to be able to give you specific advice on how you can optimize care for your baby. She'll put you in touch with other supports within the community that you may be unaware of, for example. Um, and she is your advocate. It's one of the brilliant things about British midwifery is that they are not passive agents. Uh, they are very much on the side of their mums. They advocate for them uh, and they are very independent. Uh, and so they take their job very seriously. So each mum that comes and sits in front of them uh, uh, receives their full attention uh, and will be given on the basis of that booking history, yeah. um, a sort of personalised plan for further care. And for most mothers, there'll be either that individual they'll see again or a team of midwives who they will see throughout the pregnancy. And that strand of continuity throughout the pregnancy is really important because, you know, when you meet up again at 16 weeks, they'll say, um, were you able to continue taking your polyte or how was the sickness? Yeah. You feel part somebody understands where yeah. you come from you know how's that wretched mother-in-law coming along you know <laughs> um, there are ways there are ways in which that sort of that professional bond is strengthened uh, throughout the pregnancy and that subconsciously is a really important part mm -hmm. of healthy pregnancy um make sure you attend your scans um usually there's one at around about 12 weeks and one around about 20 weeks uh, and keep all the appointments that your community midwife uh, makes with you. And if she feels that it's important to refer you in for further assistance or advice to the hospital, make those appointments uh, as well. Um, if you don't understand what the, the doctor is going on at you about, which is usually down the end of the phone these days, um, mm -hmm. because most consultations are remote, which works well, um, but not always. If you don't understand, please, get back in touch with your community midwife. She is your advocate okay. throughout the pregnancy. Write down questions that you want answers to. Um, and make use of the hospital services that are there if you come across a problem that you're not quite certain about. Say, for example, if you uh, feel um, pressure or bleeding or you lose your mucus plug in the middle of pregnancy, please get in touch with your it's like an a and &E department for mums, uh, usually called a, a triage centre, a maternity triage centre. Most maternity units have them these days. Please get in touch with them. They are there to look after you uh, as a, as a mum who's expecting, rather than it's not, not don't go to A&E, go to these centres. Um, please make all the appointments for your sort of prenatal appointments that uh, perhaps either in a group or um, 
individually will 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 teach you about um, labor and birth and preparation for the newborn and life after birth you know so mm-hmm. um yeah. sadly sadly it doesn't stop when the baby comes you know you, you then have to look after them look after them and that, that can be quite a shock sometimes um so again all these provide support in your community but also knowledge uh, which will empower you to make the right decisions so i think it is recognizing who's on your side so much of the rest of our life is spent in opposition with everybody else. You know, nobody, everybody's after our money. Everybody's after our space or our property or our, you know, everything. Uh, but in pregnancy, in your midwife, you have somebody who is on your side and wants the best for you. And generally speaking, the rest of the maternity unit function in that mode as well. So please believe that they can... They can, they can and will care for you yeah. because that's what they're there for. Yes. So you're you're really not on your own, are you? As you say, there is somebody there um, who is on your side. So, oh, uh, thank you ever so much uh, for chatting to me uh, this morning, Nigel. Was there anything else you wanted to add, or anything we didn't get round to? No, I I, I think uh, as a researcher and as a practitioner, if you like, and also mm-hmm. somebody who's involved in public discourse in these matters, mm-hmm. we, we really do rely on, um, uh, on our mums, uh, and uh, you know, whether they're currently pregnant or have had babies or whatever, to, to comment on that. You know, we, we okay. sometimes get locked in our own little bubble about what we think is important. Uh, and... Uh, not infrequently, the best ideas come from uh, come from mums because you know it's like mm. when you look at the, the the story of a pregnancy. You can either look at what was written down in your notes, and that provides a very medicalized narrative of everything that happened. But frequently, the greatest insights come from parents when you speak with them afterwards, and they say, "Well, actually, I noticed this before I came in with that." Okay. Um, so. Again, we try and do that, uh, and we are getting better at um, uh, what we sort of, you know, that, that interaction as we devise uh, studies to examine issues. We rely on, on public interaction to inform that. Um, but uh, the, working with a charity like Cereba means that you can be the conduit for ideas and comments and requests that. Uh, we are only too happy to deal with. So please reach out uh, and uh, and get in touch with us. Um, you know, again, these days, people can email me directly. Now, you know, quite a few questions I won't have the foggiest about, but I might be able to signpost in the right direction. Yes. Uh, and I think we are uh, in an era where engagement is far broader than it ever was before. But that's a positive thing because... Mm-hmm. We're getting everybody's brains working on the issue uh, and, and not just, you know, one or two people who uh, may be quite lopsided in their approach. So please, uh, you know, we, we, we always want to engage and, um, uh, and, and to be challenged in what we're doing because that sharpens the tool, if you like, um, yeah. in, in terms of where we're heading. Great. Well, thank you, Nigel. Um, I know you're extremely busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and it's lovely to see you and uh, hope to see you in person <laughs> yeah, very soon. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Elaine. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.